um, in the Charlotte area or even in the state of North Carolina to keep more of you quality coaches that we see here at the podium here in the state. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah. Tell me I can't talk. <laughs> yeah, Joe, Joe's on restrictions. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Mike, because Ms. Turner's going to be mad at us now. Um, well, I, I don't think it's an easy fix, obviously. Uh, I think North Carolina high school, um, high schools and the, and the public education just need to uh, respect the job that we do, maybe just a bit more, um, respect the amount of hours we put in, maybe respect, again, the influence and impact we have on young people. Um, obviously, the data always shows that kids who are involved in sports tend to be a little bit better academically and socially. Um, so then, I think other states like Georgia, like South Carolina, like Texas, uh, where there are, you know, high, high coaching salaries, they understand that uh, and they place a premium on that. And then also on top of that, they can figure out different ways to make money for education through that. So um, I think just other places take the time to actually evaluate it, put a plan together and actually put that plan into action rather than just saying it's impossible. So um, that's all I really can think of that will make it better. But outside of that, if, if they don't feel really feel that we have any value, then it will continue to be what it's going to be. I, I, I think, did a. Uh, <laughs> 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 and sir, um, <laughs> you know, obviously it's a hot topic. Um, but uh, I think Coach Ray said it best. You have, you have to make your program something that, like, kids want to be there, kids want to play. You can't stop the trade. Parents are going to up and move and find ways because at the end of the day, I had this conversation a couple weeks ago. I don't have kids of my own except for the ones that are on my team. But parents are always going to do what's best for their kids, what they feel is best for their kids. Um, typically, that happens when they look and see um, a program that, hey, this, this school sending X amount of kids off to college. Um, this program is, they can look at the weight room, look at the jerseys, look at all these things that these kids are exposed to. I know one of the big things is social media. I'm not a huge social media guy, but I'm learning to be that because that's the day and age that we're in. Um, it just, it does, it brings more exposure to the program. Like, I'm not going to be naive enough to think that, hey, if down the street at South Mech, they are giving more exposure, more kids are going off to college, that some of my guys and their families might not think that's a better opportunity. I myself was a transfer. Um, I got an opportunity to play in college because I went to a school that put me in a position uh, to showcase my talents a little bit better. And because of that, my parents didn't have to pay for college. I had a great opportunity. And truthfully, it's what turned me into being a, a high school coach. So I, I won't be naive to know that that's the type of thing that is going on in not just North Carolina, it's going on everywhere. Um, I mean, in some states, you got open enrollment. You know, so. <clears throat> as a coach and at a program in North Carolina, when you know these things are going on, one, at the end of the day, you gotta coach the kids that are in your program. Like you gotta, and, and truthfully, it, it sounds funny, but just like I talk to college coaches all the time, like they have to, they have to recruit kids that are actually on campus playing for them. And what does that look like? That looks like showing up, being consistent, having practice plans, like being structured so that your kids understand and know, hey, at the end of the day, like, I'm being developed. I know they care about my academics. I know they care about me as a person. Why would I want to go somewhere else? Because I don't know if I'm going to get the same thing. So, I mean, at the end of the day, you're going to continue to see kids transfer. You're going to continue to see the, <laughs> the I'm committed to this school for this, this semester and all these different types of things that I think us as coaches kind of joke about. But at the end of the day, it is what it is. And it is how can we adapt? Um, and how can we continue to make it better for our programs? So this year, we, we lost a handful of kids this year in, in the transfer process. Um, and I've always said, if a kid wants to play football for us, that, that's great. Right? We'll, we'll coach you up, we'll make that experience great for you. But if you don't want to be here, you want to be somewhere else, <clears throat> that's also fine. And, and this year, we lost a couple, two all-conference kids to one program in CMS and another kid that went to South Point when they left. First thing I did is I called that coach and told him what kind of kid he is, right? Because I want them to start off on the right foot. Um, and then even last week, I was um, me and Coach Thompson talking about a kid that left to go to the Olympic, right? And we're in a unique situation at Phil Berry because uh, we can't get transfers to come into us, right? They get 365, so we don't really have to live in a world of bringing kids in. But any kid could leave us at any moment. They can walk into school, 
throw in the class, don't like me, don't like anything, and go back to their home school. So our world is we have to make sure we retain. And so that side of it is we're kind of on the other side of the recruiting pile of, hey, we got to make sure we keep our kids. But at the end of the day, I'm not holding any kid back from an opportunity. And, and I think uh, you put a whistle around your neck to make a difference. And if another coach can do that for that kid, that's fine. Because we're going to go with the kids to show up August 1st and, and make it happen that way. And, and if a kid's in a better situation somewhere else, that's, that's okay too. Um, one, th one thing that when you look at it, it's like when a kid's in your program, they got to know what you care about, right? Like Tamarvion Williams is one of my players. He's sitting over here. And uh, Tamarvion will tell you, I'm really, really hard on him. Like, really hard on him. Fair. But he knows where I'm coming from, right? And he knows that I'm hard on him because I care about him, as, more so as a person than a player. Um, and that's the thing is like the kids enjoy being around you every day because you're doing the right. And these guys are very perceptive. You, high school football players are very perceptive. They know when you're full of it, right? They know they know what's what's what. So if you're not giving them the real every day and you're not taking care of them as people and as players, then they should leave. Because if you're not doing the things you're supposed to, then I, my son's a rising sophomore. He plays football. I ask my coaches all the time, "What are you a coach that I want my son to play for?" I mean, Mike, you know my son. You know, you've known him for years. Are you the type of coach that I would want my – if I came to practice and saw you addressing a player and that was my son, would I want my son to play for you? So as coaches, we have to be people and leaders that kids want to play for. And you kill all that transfer stuff. I, I had a parent say something to me, like, hey, you got coaches trying to undercut you and take your players. And I asked him, I said, well, why haven't you told them that you're just a South – he's a South Bend football player, stop calling I said, so if, that, if you're entertaining that, feel free to go ahead and leave now. And being straightforward with that, I mean, there's no issues. So they know you care about them. You treat them the right way. You take care of them. You feed, I mean, like I feed guys all the time. They'll tell you, they, they ask for food, they get food. Right? They need rides, I get, I get rides. We take care of our players. And South Bay used to be a place where kids left all the time. Ain't nobody leaving anymore. There's a reason. That was my two minutes. <laughs> hey, I don't know. I want to say something before we move on. I just want to give a different perspective to recruiting. I think a lot of coaches in Charlotte get a bad rap for recruiting kids. Uh, you know, I, I know this is my fifth year as a head coach, and I feel like I know most of the head coaches in the city decently now. Uh, guys, it's rare that these head coaches are calling parents saying, hey, come to my school. Uh, kind of like uh, uh, Coach said earlier, I mean, parents are going to put them, their kids in the best position to be successful or reach their goals, whatever they are. So, man, a lot of times, man, these coaches aren't, especially the head coaches, the ones I know the most, they're not reaching out, calling, and saying, hey, trying to undercut other coaches, come to, you know, come to my school. So I just kind of wanted to look, talk about it from a different perspective and advocate for the coaches a little bit. Like, sometimes you hear that stuff that's not always true. Um, again, I've never reached out to a kid. It's, you know, parents call me all the time, right? But that's just not how I go. So I just wanted to advocate for some of the coaches. I know we get a bad rap, so talk about recruiting from a different perspective. Uh, so there's a lot of movement. Um, people get promoted, get new jobs, uh, getting out of the profession. Um, it, it, it's a struggle every year. Um, I know this year we had a few positions to fill. Uh, honestly, there wasn't a huge applicant pool. Um, we kind of got really lucky. We had two assistants that don't, or they're basically self-employed, can make their own hours. Uh, so they didn't need a teaching job. They didn't ask to be paid um, because we only have, what, seven stipends to pay coaches, including ourselves. Um, so it's, it's uh, extremely challenging every season to get a good coaching staff. Um, and, you know, we've been fortunate to be able to keep the core of our coaching staff together for a few years, which is why I think we've had success. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's definitely one of the biggest challenges that, that we have to deal with. Um, I'll say as a, as a coach who had just had to open school, and, and honestly, when I started, uh, started late last spring, so kind of had to throw a staff, throw a staff together. Um, even at the end of the day, you still don't just want a warm body out there, right? You want someone who's knowledgeable. Uh, for me personally, I want pers a person who cares about kids, right? They got to be kid-centered. If they're not kid-centered, I don't want them, right? Anybody can learn how to coach football. Anybody, right? There's enough information out there nowadays. Anybody can learn how to coach the game of football. You they care about kids, right? That's, that's ultimately number one, right? When you find them a job, TA, teacher, whatever, right? So. To me, the struggle is there. The struggle is real, right? Because you want good coaches, but again, you gotta have good people first, right? And I think too often we keep valuing 
good coach, but terrible people, right? We got to value good people who do coach rather than good coaches who are terrible people. Um, so uh, again, that's kind of my personal goal, just to always find good people. Uh, and then, you know, Coach Thompson, who spoke at the coaches symposium last Friday, spoke to young coaches who want to possibly become head coaches, right? You want to find people who want to work a little, right? Right, when I got my job and, and, and Mr. Morrow interviewed me and someone said, well, what did it take? I said, well, I just put my head down and wanted to work a little bit, right? So I got up under a couple head coaches who forced me to work, right? And again, from there, you'll get the people who you really need, right? Because at the end of the day, you might have a staff of seven, you might have a staff of 15. But if only two guys really work hard for you, that staff don't need much anyway, right? So again, you want good people, right? You want to work hard. Everything else, honestly, can be worked out, but you just got to have good people who want to work hard. Um, that kind of piggyback on what he says, like, they're not good for kids. They can't be around. If they're, if they're bad people, like, you're not going to have them around. The thing I do is when I bring on a new assistant, um, usually my younger guys that come in, I'm like, there's two things you're going to do. You're going to do laundry, you're going to paint fields. And because when I started at Independence High School as an assistant coach, Coach Gallagher told me, he was like, you're going to drive a bus, you're going to paint fields, and you're going to do laundry. If you can't do any of those three, then you can't be here, right? So then you ask that question, you say, can you do those three things? And you get somebody that doesn't even doesn't even hesitate, yes, I'm in. And they're good people, right? Like he said, you can't by football, right? But if they're willing to work, they're good for kids, they can be around. Right yeah, absolutely. And I'm gonna piggyback off both of them. Um, just the idea of bringing a guy into your program that truly understands what it means to be a coach. Um, kind of to piggyback off the laundry and the painting the fields. Um, I did an outing with my coaches and their significant others about two weekends ago, and I have stopped to thank the wives because I understand that I'm asking a lot of them and they do everything that I ask. And what does that look like? We, we had practice this morning. I gave them tomorrow off because we're about to get in full, full swing, but our weeks are full. Some of them are teachers in the building. Some of them have other jobs. Um, that's when you really know if you have a coach that really wants to do it. Because this, this, people say, oh, I have this kind of back and forth with my dad. He's never coached before. He's a, a sports fanatic, but he's never coached, so he feels like he gets it. He's like, I don't understand why you're just always at the school and you're always doing football stuff. And I'm like, well, if I don't, things don't get done. And my staff takes on kind of the same responsibility, uh, whether it be laundry, like literally sitting up here, one of the coaches just texts me, hey, coach, I just flipped the laundry. Nope, nobody, nobody even thought about that when they left practice today. They put their stuff in the bin, they put it on the loop, they left out, and on Monday, their stuff will be clean. Well, how did it get clean? Coaches put it in, right? How did the field get painted? I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, like jokingly, one of, uh, I don't even know if he's in this bunch, but I had a, a, a player who called me Bam Bam this morning. Actually, one of the coaches called me Bam Bam this morning because I was finishing painting lines because we had practice at another location and I needed to finish painting lines. I got out there early before we actually blew the whistle up to start pre-practice. I'm out there with no shoes on, finishing up, and then I went right to practice with the D-line. So it, it's, it's a process. People, people think it's just Friday night, or they think it's just Thursday night. You know, going to pick up buses in the morning, you know, getting food, like it's, it's so many different things. But at the end of the day, when you got guys around that love to do it, and love to be around the kids, it's not work. I might get stressed a little bit, I mean, winning enough games, and people yelling in the stands, or, you know, the kid shows up late in class and the assistant principal is coming to your office to tell you. But it's, I, I love it. All these guys love to do it um, and we'll continue to do that. But when you get guys around you that feel the same way, you, you got a good thing going. I'm very grateful. Uh, Greg Jack actually did my first job in the coaching business. So uh, when I was there, the big takeaway and what I'm trying to build now for the Bears is uh, that group is a lot of we became friends and we uh, enjoy being together. And I think you spend a lot of time with these, these men and you, you take away from them their significant others. So if they're going to come put a whistle around their neck for our program, I want to make sure that we can have a friendship. Right? I'm not going to be friends with everybody outside of football, but I want to enjoy my time with you because half this 
football business is people business, right? It's the people you're around, whether it's the young athletes that we impact, but it's also the coaches. Uh, one thing that I took from when Greg interviewed me, and it's kind of a, uh, I guess a model for what I do in my interview, is I asked, do you want to be a football coach? Because if you do, you're going to treat your position group or your side of the football with the same emphasis that I do for our program. So when I step away, I get pulled in whatever direction, parent, AD, administration, you're going to carry the weight of this program for me. And I think I'm always very thankful that my time there and kind of how my coaching journey has gone, but without the, the kickstart in that experience, I, I don't know if I would have built the staff I did because I would have brought in X and O guys that do air raid and you name it, whatever. It, I mean, in, in, in retrospect, we all run the same stuff, right? Now, our playbooks are spitting business of each other, but it's the way you install. It's the way, I said this earlier, like, kids don't want to play for people they don't like. And I think what you see here is there's six guys that I think all kids can relate to and get something from. So now it's about building your staff behind that with other guys that kids want to be around. And then and ultimately, you as a coach, you want to be around. Okay, so I'm going to ask you from a different perspective and advocate for the coaches again. So, a couple of things. One, real quick, you can cut the camera if you want to. Just got to shout out one of my favorite players I ever coached, Jalen Morris, is in the building. What's up, big dog? Oh, good. Yes, sir. Uh, second thing is. Uh, he smiles all the time. Yeah, that's my dog. He's smiling. Other thing, one thing y'all didn't make, is coaches to film up yet? Like, man, that, <laughs> that stuff don't just get cut, man. <laughs> Friday nights is the easy part. Um, you know, it's a lot of time goes into it. I mean, just feeding the guys, you know, traveling, all that stuff. Um, but one thing I'm going to say, like, yes, we're all head coaches. I mean, we got into this crazy business because we're weird like that. So we do a lot of work for very little pay. But for me to ask a guy, an assistant coach, to trying to build a staff of guys that uh, don't make a ton of money, like financially, like, it just doesn't make sense to most people for significant others, right? Uh, especially, like, I'm a, like, very demanding coach. Like, I'm very demanding on my players, like, even more so on my coaching staff. And, like, sometimes it doesn't make sense. It's a, uh, it's the truth. I'm the, you know, non-coaching world people know this, but, like, coaches make, like, 11 cents an hour for the year, like, the amount of time we put in. So, you know, when you, you know, doing your town hall meetings and voting and all that stuff, like, you can't want that I get a raise. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's my thing is like everybody in here wants their kid being coached hard, being coached well, and making sure that they're developing them and put them in a position, and making sure they're good people and all the stuff we just named. Like, thank you, you got to pay for them a little bit. So I just want to advocate for the dudes. Uh, I, I always say, man, I, I only want what, I, what I'm worth. Nothing more, nothing less. You know, nothing more, nothing less. And, you know, again, I do this for the long haul, but trying to build a good staff when, when those are the numbers, uh, it's just tough. I no. uh, I'm going to say uh, yes, because again, kids do need resets, right? They need a reset. Sometimes different environments produce different people, right? Just point blank period. If they go to a different school, sometimes they become a completely different individual, good and bad, all right? So I think them earning a reset or having the opportunity to reset should be considered. Um, no, because again, now, um, what happens if what you thought or, or what your perception of what was going to happen doesn't happen anymore, right? Now, was it really worth it? Was it, was it worth it breaking the relationships of playing with your uh, elementary school and middle school buddies? Uh, was it worth it now traveling across city, uh, I mean, ungodly hours, right? You know, again, I, I have my initial coaching experience with CMS was at Philadelphia. So I understand the kids at Philip O'Reilly that Coach Reddy uh, has to uh, work with. I understand their commitment to get, to being an athlete at Philip O'Reilly. Because they're getting up to get on a bus at 5.30, 5.45 in the morning, right, to ride all the way to Philip O'Reilly, and then they stay after school for practice, right? So again, it's extremely tough. So now if you start talking about young people having to travel from here to North Charlotte, or here to East Charlotte, or from South Neck to West Charlotte. I mean, you're talking about uh, kids making, uh, you know, sacrifices. I'm not sure they're really, you know, really ready to make. Um, and parents as well, because again, that, that would be very, very tough on some families. Uh, tough because again, it's just mom, or it might just be dad, or it might be grandma, or grandpa. So I think it is um, something that possibly could be considered, but it needs to be come with a little bit of uh, consideration for those for those type of items. Uh, I do think uh, also, and then again, it takes away opportunities for kids who don't want to leave their school, 
right, that truly just want to be a South Mex Sabre, an Argykel Knight, uh, an Olympic Trojan, and so forth. They want to be able to say that they did four years at that school and don't necessarily want to get passed over because 20 kids walked in the hallway uh, one morning, right? They didn't even know about it. Just 20 kids showed up, right? So um, I think, again, it's a 50-50 for me. Um, and I'm not really a 50-50 guy. I'm usually, I, I know what I like, but that's one I'm kind of torn about. Yeah, I would just say no. Uh, <laughs> I didn't realize that East Forsyth was open enrollment until we were playing a playoff game. I was talking to their coach before before the game started. He told me, I was like, oh, okay, that makes a little more sense. But he said they, yeah, they have about 20 kids every year that they're coming and going uh, from the program. And I just think it's really important. I know all these guys do this with building their program. Having the kids for four years, having them be a part of your, of your program, your school, having that school pride, the community pride. Like my players said, a lot of them have played together since Pop and Warner. Um, and for kids to just be moving in and out to different schools, I think takes away from a lot of the specialness of high school football, uh, the community aspect of it, school pride and all that. So, um, you know, I talked to my kids the other day about you know, being where your feet are, but growing where you're planted. And if you're constantly looking for something better, you're constantly scrolling and looking at what everybody else is doing, uh, your, your focus isn't on where you are right now and, and what you can be doing to, to make that situation the best. So, I mean, I agree with Coach, and some kids might need a reset, um, but I, I don't think open enrollment is the answer. Uh, I'm kind of I'm yes or no, but if you think about it, um, transfer portal in college, NIL in college, sounded like really good ideas. Right? What's the plan? Because if you look at it, yeah, you can look at Alabama quarterback has this in NIL, right? How is it being, how, how are the checks and balances, right? Um, you look at transfer portal in college football. 15, 15% of the players that were in the football transfer portal went to a different school last year. 15%, right? Oh, I'm just going to hit the portal. You go right ahead. 15% got placed in a different school last year, right? So open enrollment, yeah. You, I mean, it can be good if it's put together the right way. Um, I, would, I would hope there would be a really good plan to put it in action. Um, you know, not, I'm not gonna say anything that's gonna get me in trouble, but I just, I just think that'd be a lot, of, uh, a lot of red tape to climb through to get into open enrollment. You know, so if, you, if, you go, if you go somewhere where you think you can get a reset, like you said, you, you, know, you, keep, you keep pulling that plan up, eventually that plan's gonna die, right? You keep uprooting it and moving it, up, 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 up. finally mom's gonna say, you know what, I'm not driving you, I'm not driving you to hook. I'm not driving you to North Bend. We live in South Charlotte, right? No, we're not going up there anymore, because that's two hours in the car, and I still gotta work, and I still gotta get up in the morning, and you got a little sister who does this, and a little brother who does that. So there's positives and negatives to it, absolutely. But I think the most important thing will be, what are the legs that it stands on? What's the most important thing is getting it the plan to put it in the play. <laughs> So I'm gonna go with no on this one. Um, Coach Thompson just mentioned something that, that kind of stands out to me. I think if you if you have open enrollment here in Charlotte, um, I think you got about three to four programs that will benefit, and then everybody else is kind of falling by the wayside. And and again, it goes back to the initial conversation of being able to kind of market your program. I mean, you just, you, you look at the programs around Charlotte. I mean, people talk all the time, Myers Park, you know, kind of where we're located, <coughs> kind of the resources we have. There are a lot of schools that are fortunate, and then there's some that are not. Um, I mean, just, just call a spade a spade. If we have open enrollment, kids not, they're not going to guarantee. Right, they're, the guarantee's gonna suffer because of that. You know, kids are gonna decide to go to Hardy. Not that either one of those places are bad schools or bad programs or their coaches or their, you know, the administration doesn't do a really good job, but it, it just is the landscape that we're in. This is what um, kind of in terms of networking and, 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 and the different resources that these different places have in comparison to others is not the same. It's not, a, it's not an equal playing field, if we want to be honest. Um, so if, if you bring open enrollment to a city like Charlotte, and I'm from Atlanta, so Atlanta's a big city. There's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of schools that benefit from it. And there are a lot of schools that don't. And the schools that don't, athletics is almost non-existent because they can't get kids to come participate. But they have 20 kids that have transferred out you know, to some of these other um, kind of 
shiny new toys, if you will, and other programs. So I, I'm gonna have to go with no that one. So I can probably get the, I guess, the best perspective on what my enrollment might look like, uh, because Philbo Perry is a STEM academy, and we get kids from all over the city. The difference being, we get them typically in eighth grade or ninth grade when they come to us. Uh, the challenges with that that I've learned very quickly is that you're bringing kids that didn't play youth football together, didn't play middle school football together, and now they're in the locker room all together. So you have to create a culture of this family, and I hate throwing around the word culture, so So when it comes to culture, I think it's a buzzword that people throw around with pool tables and ping pong tables and it's the branding. Well, culture is really about cultivating a family and uh, an experience. So when it comes to open enrollment, I, like these guys said, is you're going to get some schools that are going to take advantage of that and get all the kids. And we've been, for years, 10 years, we've probably lost some of the best football players in our school, leave, and go somewhere else for a better opportunity. Um, so open enrollment just, uh, just gets expedited and again, you, you get down to programs that aren't successful similar to ours over the past 10 years, probably are going to lose kids. Um, but I'm, I'm from a small state, the great state of Vermont. Um, those programs up there, you start in seventh grade with one group of men, and you graduate at 18 with that same group. Right? You're, you're helping in somebody's minivan, you're going to Dairy Queen, right? you're going to pool parties, you get these relationships. Um, I think, and I'm probably the youngest guy at this table, like, to me, that's what football's all about, is these families, relationships, these friendships. And I think with open enrollment, you kind of just, you, you get the car before the horse. Like, be with, you know, be with the team you're going Enjoy that experience, because someday you're going to get these weddings with those people, right? Those are going to be people you call when you need something. And, and I always feel like, in, in this world of transfers in high school, it's hard to go somewhere as a senior in high school and be the, the, the outcast. Football aside, like, you go for it, we're going to have some kids who left our program. My, my comment to them is always this. In our locker room, you, you pick the music, you pick your number, right? you go to the locker room you want, you, you kind of, you get to be the man, right? When you leave here, someone else is the man. So it, it's kind of building that, that process of, you get to the end, and then you go leave, right? Just to go get a scholarship that Vincent isn't guaranteed. So I always think sometimes it's about being where your feet are, like this guy said, it's, it's a phrase that's used across all. But it's also about being with your guys. Like you go to war with these guys for three years, then you just up and leave. And uh, I guess if you're going to transfer in high school, you also might transfer in college. So I, I, I was telling your kid that it's what you are is everything you do. Yeah, you know, everybody kind of spoken, so I'll make it short. Um, if, I mean, if I was the school that everybody was coming to, of course, I'd be on for it. But I think that's <laughs> fair to be fair. I think the answer has to be no. I think that should be a statewide thing, not a citywide thing. Like, if you're a public school, and we all like playing each other in the playoffs and everything, it's gotta be the same regulations. And I think, ultimately, like, the only way to make it fair is make transferring hard, and everybody has to play wherever they're zone. That's just kind of what it is. Uh, I know it's a hot topic, but that's my short answer.